You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're talking about Utah. So Lauren? Yes, Kenzie? Let's get scary. We are recording in my new apartment. Townhouse. Townhouse. <laughs> um, so if it is echoey, apologies. <laughs> it's creaky, too. We'll also hear Roy's little clicky clackies. Okay. Oh, mom's here. Say hi, mom. Hopefully See if you can hear it. Hopefully you can hear that. <laughs> so we have a live audience for the first time. I know. How exciting. I know. It's good practice. And because I know everyone wants to know this, I watched Twister yesterday. For the first time? No. Oh. You asked me that yesterday, too. It was for the first time in many, many years. This is practically the first time. But it was not the first time. So now I'm ready for Twister's. I love that movie. I'm excited to it's watch this. great movie. It is a good one. It's a very good movie. Acting's not the best. No. Some of the facial features, you're like, oh, you're really creepy. Because <laughs> the one main guy, yeah. he smiles a lot when he talks. So he just talks like this, and it's really creepy. Really? Yeah. We were watching it, lot, obviously. And there were just parts where I was like, mm, you would have died, or mm, I don't think that happened, but whatever. It was a good movie. You're one of those. It's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> it's a movie <laughs> i know i know well there was one part where i said something and i was like well how come that didn't work this time and oh when well, they're trying to do dorothy mm -hmm. and he's pressing all the buttons and all this stuff and like the storm's going on because it didn't well no but then when she has to do it for the next time they do it she just presses one button because they fixed it no it was a different prototype they had right. one through four so they had a different one i don't know it was just i was like mm, doesn't make sense of and all the things that happened in that movie, that's what, <laughs> that's the one you hold on to. Yeah. Just Not like, when they were belted to a freaking pipe. Pipe. That's the part where I'm like, you would have died. <laughs> <laughs> and at the beginning of it, when she's like, you know, we're seeing her childhood and like what she wants to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Their dog is like, they run out of the house and they grab her and run out with her. The dog's just on the bed. So I'm like, save your dog. The dog had to run after them. And then they close the latch almost without the dog in there. Yeah, I know. That would stress me out. And then let the dog back in. I was like, you are not good pet parents. <laughs> <laughs> it stressed me out. Yeah. And then, of course, Roy got afraid, like got scared of one of the thunder scenes. So he's shaking. I was like, it is a movie. <laughs> I mean, I get it because literally a tornado is probably my biggest fear in terms of weather. Yeah. Like, remember how there was a 23 long mile tornado that we talked about? Or 23 mile long? Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, Utah's facts are actually kind of cool. All right. I think so anyway. So we'll get into them. If you don't mind a hint of danger, Zion National Park offers the ideal hike for a scorching summer afternoon. That's because the 16-mile Narrows Trail in Zion Canyon doesn't just meander along the Virgin River. In many places, it is the river. <laughs> <laughs> Wear a bathing suit and sturdy waterproof sandals because much of the hike is spent wading and several spots are deep enough for swimming. I would have 100% said wadding. Oh my god. <laughs> I spent wadding. <laughs> Rock walls carved by water over millions of years tower 2,000 feet above you, and the canyon is only 20 feet wide in places. Most day hikers start at the south end, walk upstream a mile or two, and then turn around. But if you get up early and arrange a shuttle drop-off, you can hike the whole length in one day. Or better yet, get a permit to camp. That sounds like something you would be so excited to do. I'd hike. Yeah, but permit to camp afterwards? Absolutely not. <laughs> Just don't go if thunderstorms are threatening, because flash floods can be a real hazard. That was my first idea. Let's go in a thunderstorm. <laughs> Because I had so much well, fun being outside in a thunderstorm the first time. Yep, that went really well. Archaeologists know that people have lived in the land now called Utah for more than 12,000 years, thanks to a recently discovered Ice Age campsite. There, experts found a spear point used to hunt mammoths, as well as bones from waterfowl that prehistoric people probably cooked. Good job for getting waterfowl. How did you think I was going to say it? Waterfall. Oh. Oh. No. That's you. why I said good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Utah is one of the four corner states, which is the only place in the country where four states come together. Utah's southeastern corners touch Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Bryce Canyon is known for its hoodoos, rock pillars that look like crazy man-made statues but are naturally formed by erosion. The Basin and Ridge region crosses western Utah and includes mountains and salt flats. Here is where you'll find the Great Salt Lake, which is even saltier than the ocean. Is that one of the places where, maybe it's just the Dead Sea, where you can lay and you're so buoyant because of the salt? I don't know if it's, is it there, Mom? Mom says yes. And the Dead Sea. Oh, look at us. Mom says yes. 
We have our fact checker with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Boonville Salt Flats are a vast expanse of salt spanning a massive 30,000 acres. Its featureless and singularly flat landscape makes it the perfect venue for some of the world's most demanding land speed races. In 1964, a legendary car racer, Norman Craig Breedlove, made headlines when he attempted to break the world. We had a teacher with that name. Breedlove? He was a science teacher. Did you have him for science in eighth no. grade? Who'd you have in eighth grade? I don't remember. <laughs> Breed love? Yeah, that was, yes. It was my physics teacher. You did physics in eighth grade? That's what we all did. No, we didn't. Yeah, we did. Not in eighth grade. We didn't do physics. Like eighth grade physics, not like physics physics. Oh, because we did physics physics in high school. You did physics physics I did. in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I took environmental science. <laughs> It's like, now that you said it, maybe that's why I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds familiar. Who did you have for science? I don't remember at all. That's the one thing I'm good at. I can remember, like, all of my teachers. I only remember my physics teacher. See the one that lost an eyeball? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Didn't someone lose an eyeball? I don't know. Every time we would talk about the Pythagorean theorem, he would flick the lights and go, the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> there was definitely a teacher at our school that lost an eyeball. Or something like that. Maybe. So back to this breed, love. <laughs> He attempted to break the world land speed record on the flats with his jet-powered Spirit of America vehicle. Unfortunately, Breedlove succumbed to forces beyond his control and ended up skidding off track. The six-mile skid marked one of the longest continuous tread tire skids in history. Did he die? I don't know. I Leaving us on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yep, I have no idea. Um, I think this is also where they, to break the sound barrier for the first time. Oh! I think this was that area i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure that's what it was like that <laughs> that area yeah like that rocket thingy that broke the sound barrier yeah man-made ponds in moab utah produce potassium chloride which is used in fertilizer medicines and foods the state also mines uintitate <laughs> <laughs> also called gilsonite <laughs> uintate okay a shiny black rock used in making cement asphalt and paint Copper is a state mineral, and Utah contains one of the world's largest open-pit copper mines. It's so deep that two 1,454-foot Willis Towers, the second tallest tower in the United States, could fit stacked inside it. What this means is... <laughs> you could take. <laughs> what is the largest tower? Or the tallest? Is it the Sears, or is the Sears the Willis? It's one World Trade Center. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. List of the tallest buildings. So it's... Willis Tower is now number three. Oh. What was, what's number two? Central Park Tower. Oh. Was the Willis Tower the Sears Tower? I don't know. Yes. Ah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> A top spot for seeing Utah's famous red rocks is the 200 million year old natural staircase called Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Yeah, that's so cool. That does. The Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. Quar Quar Quarry. Quarry. In Emory County has yielded more than 600 different species of dinosaur finds, some uniquely found nowhere else on Earth. In the southeast corner of Utah, visitors can experience a massive living organism unlike anything else in the world. The trembling giant, or pando, is a collection of as many as 47,000 quaking aspen trees that all share one root system. That's so fucking cool. That's weird. Uh, it's so, it sounds so cool. <laughs> Located in the Fishland National Forest, this remarkable natural wonder is one of the heaviest organisms on Earth. Believed to weigh some 4.6 million pounds. 6.5. 6.5. What did I say? 4.6? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> 6.5 million pounds. But is also among the largest living organism known to man, having germinated and grown over an astonishing 80,000 years. Isn't that so cool? <laughs> it is cool. Its appearance has long inspired awe among anyone lucky enough to behold it. Many observers liken it to a field of white ghosts shimmering beneath a canopy of bright green leaves. That is cool. Native American tribes formed over thousands of years, including the Navajo, Goshute, Ute, Paiute, Bannock, and Shoshun. Their descendants still live in the state today. These tribes have existed in Utah for centuries, passing along their powerful stories and wisdom through generations. They have their own traditions, philosophies, customs, values, history, and languages, making them all unique. Their communities have embodied an incredible pride in who they are and where they come from, which has allowed them to continue to thrive even in the face of hardship. It stands as a testament to their strength as people and is a beautiful reminder of the resilience of Native American cultures. Mic drop. I talk about one of them today. Hey. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. Uh, Utah's Arch. Arch. National uh, arches. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> arches, not arcs. 
Utah's Arches National Park is not only known for the 2,000 natural sandstone arches that it contains, but also for the honor it offers to hikers who stumble upon undocumented arches. The chance to name their discovery. That's cool. We should find an arch. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Those lucky enough to be the first ones to discover an undocumented arch are awarded the special honor of being able to give it a fitting title, offering them an experience like no other. Opportunity, but that's okay. That as well. <laughs> that would be cool. I wanted But to... I don't know how you find one that hasn't been named. Well, you got to find all the ones that are named first right. and then not go there. <laughs> You know what would suck if someone found one mm-hmm. and then they're in the process of naming it and mm-hmm. then someone else finds one and thinks that they're finding one that hasn't been named yet mm. just to only discover you're like two days too late. That would suck. Mm-hmm. That won't be us. That We won't be finding one at all. Oh. Unless you want to go to Utah and try to find one. Well, there's, I only want to see those trees. Those trees would be cool to find. So I figured while we're there. Okay. We can maybe find an orange. <laughs> you and I would be ones to stumble upon one that has never been found and is like super rare. And just be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like, wow, look at this. Very or awesome. reading the map wrong and being like, oh, that one's already named. Let's keep going. <laughs> yes. That would be us. Because um, what did you do this morning, Mackenzie? I forgot the microphone. Mackenzie was like, oh, I'll get over to your house early. We'll record. And then we're going to go out to lunch because Mackenzie's mom is here. As mom is my witness. And we're going to go get lunch afterwards. I put the mics on my bag. And then she's three minutes away. And I texted her and I said, hey, don't forget the mics. Imagine if she had responded to me right when I said I was on my way. I didn't think about it at that moment. And then I was like putting things away and I was like cleaning up. And I was like, I don't have the mics. I was like, I'm going to text her to remind her about the mics. I'm glad you did, though, even though I was super close, because I was like, that would have been even worse if I walked in here and you were like, where are the mics? And I'm like, "Mm." (laughs) (laughs) that would have been poopy. So in typical Lauren and Mackenzie fashion, we started an hour and a half late. Yeah. (laughs) But we made it. We're here. We're here. We're good. What spooky tea you pouring, Lauren? Okay. So when you think of Utah, what do you think of? Mormon. Yep. So today, (laughs) I'm going to cover the man who is known as possibly being the most controversial figure in Mormon history. Nice. John Doyle Lee. Oh, Mm -hmm. sounds sketchy. Yeah. And if you say his middle name and last name together, it's Doyle. (laughs) (laughs) So John Doyle Lee was born on September 6th or 12th. No one ever knows back then. 1812. In Kaskasia. In the Illinois Territory, just six years before Illinois became a state. He had a very tumultuous childhood. His they mother, all do. Yeah. His mother struggled through years of a lingering illness, and his father was an alcoholic. At the age of three, his mother succumbed to her illnesses, and Lee was left in the care of his alcoholic father. Mm-hmm. But only for a few years, because from the ages of seven to 16, Lee went to live with his uncle and his uncle's family. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't think it really does much. So it's not better. It's just... It's just the next step, I guess. Yes. Growing up, Lee worked hard in many various jobs. He was a mail carrier. Then on his uncle's farm, he took care of the managerial responsibilities. He then worked in Galena, Illinois as a store clerk for several years. He finally moved to Vandalia, Illinois, where he met and married Agatha Ann Woosley in 1833. So I know we're in Illinois. We will move to the state that I we didn't are covering. Say I just know you wonder it. Or like oh, it's in the back of your head. I definitely thought of it. But then I was like, well, I'm kind of like that this time. So I can't say anything. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so well in Vandalia, this is where Lee and his wife first encountered Mormonism. It was still a young and very new religion at the time. They only... hadn't even moved out to Utah yet. No. This, it was only seven years old when he joined, like, the religion. And in 1837, a Mormon missionary converted Lee and his wife to the religion. He quickly took a liking to it, and it soon became his driving force in life. What do they call it for other branches when they convert? Because I know you have, like, a baptism. But what do oh, they call it? Oh, like, what it? are the other things? Yeah, do they call it anything different? I think in Catholicism, it's a confirmation. I thought that was being baptized. We are not the right people to be, like, knowing these things. You're right. (laughs) We'll put a pin in that for later. (laughs) People can tell us. Yeah. They never do, though. That's a little frustrating. Right. When we We ask ask you things. We ask a genuine question that we want to know the answer to. And we know someone out there knows it. And no one tells us the answer. Just message us on social media and Mackenzie will reply to you. Exactly. At the age of 26. I'm a lovely person. Mackenzie. (laughs) 1838. He moved to a homestead near the Mormon town of Far West, Missouri. I know we're in Missouri. And finally joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also more commonly known as the LDS Church. Very visceral reaction. Um, Have you seen Eat, Keep Sweet, Obrey? No, I haven't. 
you're going to at them too. Oh, I know. God, fucking just send that to me. Send me the name of that because I want to watch it. It's, It's horrific. Oh, I bet. Like one of the worst. So from there, Lee started to grow close with some of the big names in Mormonism. He became close friends with the founder of the church, Joseph Smith. And here's an interesting fact. He was also the adopted son of Brigham Young. Ah, so Brigham Young isn't just a school. <laughs> Wait, what happened to his uncle? When did he get adopted? I'll explain. Okay. <laughs> so Brigham Young is also the name of the man who was the second president of the LDS Church from 1847 to 1877. And the university is named after him. Yeah, that's Have why you... I said it isn't just a school. Oh, I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> that one I missed. Because I was about to ask you if you've seen the TikToks, which no, you haven't, but. Oh, of the people at Brigham Young? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I watch them with Joe. Yeah. Um, did he show you the ones I sent him? Yes, he did. (laughs) Okay, good. He was supposed to. Yes, he did. (laughs) So fun fact, Brigham Young had at least 56 wives and (gasps) 57 children. (gasps) This is, this is why I was like, "Eh," Mm -hmm. because that shit's fucking gross. Oh, I'll get more into that. So Lee was adopted by Young through the Mormon law of adoption. So this was, quote, a ritual practiced in temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints between 1846 and 1894. And in which men who held priesthood were sealed in a father-son relationship to other men who were not part of nor even distantly related to their immediate nuclear family. So it was a way for them to, I guess, find a Mormon family. Okay. Like bigs and littles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In 1839, Lee and his friend Levi Stewart served a Mormon mission trip where they traveled to Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee preaching about their religion and hoping to get people to convert. I feel like it's not a mission trip if you're still in the country. People go on mission trips. Kentucky's a big one. I know. I'm it, just saying. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> so an interesting note here, Lee was able to convert and baptize Wild Bill Hickman. I don't know who that is. So Hickman was an American frontiersman. He also served as a representative to the Utah Territorial Legislature. So he went far into Mormonism. He later served as a personal bodyguard for Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He was reputedly a member of the... Danites. So Lee was also a member of the Danites, the same group. So they were a fraternal organization founded by LDS members in June of 1838. They operated as a sort of vigilante group. Oh, sweet Jesus. (laughs) And took a central role in the events of the 1838 Mormon War. There was a Mormon War. Yes. So this was a war that took place in Missouri between Mormons and non-Mormons from August to November of 1838. Uh, Is this why they went to Utah? To have religious freedom. We'll get to it, sort of. So a large influx for this war, a large influx of Mormons had moved into northwest Missouri, which Mm -hmm. caused tension with the non-Mormon population. They resented the political and economic power that the Mormon community had acquired. Fair. Missourians even tried to block them from voting during this time. (laughs) Individual. What does it feel like to not have someone want you to have your rights? Hmm? Hmm. Individual confrontations were just the start. They soon turned into near warfare between the two groups, including murder, destruction of property, and cycles of raid and counter raids. See, I would want to hear both sides. (laughs) (laughs) Lee was one of the members who played an active role in many of these conflicts. Eventually, the governor of Missouri had had enough and ordered the Mormons to leave Missouri or they would be killed. Expelled or exterminated, as he said. An army was sent to the Mormon community, which they surrounded and forced the Mormon leadership to surrender. It is unclear if Joseph Smith endorsed the group's actions. Some said he did at first, but then turned against it as violence increased. According to Wikipedia, quote, according to an essay on the website of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Historians generally concur that Joseph Smith approved of the Danites, but that he probably was not briefed on all of their plans and likely did not sanction the full range of their activities. So he knew what they were doing, but not fully what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So he was aware of them, but not blissful ignorance. Yes. The actions of the Danites inspired a hysteria in Missouri that eventually led to the extermination order. That whole expel or exterminate. Yeah. Lee was really gaining authority and notoriety within the group. He served as an official scribe for the Council of Fifty. This council was a group of men, (gasps) shocking, who provided guidance in practical matters of the church. Mainly zero rights. Yeah. Mainly there. Less rights in that religion than they do in this country. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So they were concerned with moving and expanding their religion westward, more towards the Rocky Mountains. Lee was promoted to priesthood and was made a member of the first 
Quorum of the Seventy. This group directed the church's extensive missionary actions. He also spent time converting folks in Illinois, Tennessee, and Kentucky, like he did when he first joined the religion. His work impressed the church so much that in 1843, he was chosen to guard the home of Joseph Smith, the church's founder and prophet. And this was a prestigious position. I guess. Then in June of 1844, while Smith was in jail, he was in a jail cell in Carthage, Illinois, don't know why he was there, didn't look into it, an angry mob dragged Smith and his brother out of the cell and murdered them. Wait. So... Smith. Joseph Smith. Not your guy. No. Okay. Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, was in a jail cell in Illinois for some reason. Uh-huh. This was after, like, my guy, Lee, not my guy, Lee, was not, like, guarding him anymore uh-huh. because he was in jail. An angry mob dragged him and his brother out and murdered them. Uh-huh. So they, the leader of Mormonism is murdered. This caused a crisis in the church in regards to leadership. Well. But the church continued on, and eventually Brigham Young was named the new leader. Uh-huh. In 1843, the year prior, the church formally announced the doctrine of plural marriage. (gasps) Lee quickly accepted this new doctrine, soon taking five more wives. In total, he had 19 wives, though at least 11 eventually left him. And from that, he had 59 children. But yeah, it's women who need to be on birth control, not men. Uh, (laughs) Okay. What's his face from the documentary had 63? Most of them were his children. Most of him were his children? Most of his wives were his children. Oh, gross. Yes. Most of his wives were his children. Exactly. He's literally, he should have been executed. That's disgusting. Yeah. Um. But yeah, just with, uh, in one full term, like one year, a woman can only have one full term pregnancy. But a man could get a different woman pregnant every day of the year. There are literally multiple documentaries on Netflix now about men having, like with sperm donations and shit like that. There was one doctor who. Oh, yeah. Impregnated a bunch of people with his own sperm. Mm-hmm. And then there's a new one. I don't know. It's like dad of a thousand or something along those lines. And Mm -hmm. we won't get into that. Any hooser. So in 1844, with Joseph Smith's passing, Lee followed Brigham Young and other LDS members to what is now Utah. Mm -hmm. We are in Utah. I knew we'd get there. Eventually. It's about the journey, you know? It is about the journey, (laughs) the destination. There they worked on establishing new LDS communities. One of these communities was Lee's Ferry and Lonely Dell Ranch, which was located near Page, Arizona, because Utah and Arizona touch. We don't have our map, but they do. I checked. Yeah, we talked about the four yeah, corners. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify when I was doing the notes because I was like, we don't have our map to consult. That is true. So I had to say it. Well, when you was, were talking about Illinois, I was like, how close is that to Utah? <laughs> kind of far, actually. I thought so. Yeah, because okay. you'd have to pass through Iowa. You'd have to go over and down, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So while he was here in 1856, he became a U.S. Indian agent in Iron County, Utah. What the fuck does that mean? An Indian agent was a person who was authorized to interact with American Indian tribes on behalf of the government. Peacefully? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in this position, he was actually assigned to help Native Americans establish farms. Oh. So I'm hoping this is as good as it sounds. I, again, didn't look into it, but I'm hoping it's just as nice as it sounds it is. I don't think they would need help establishing farms when they're the ones who— They wouldn't. Okay. But. Maybe like officially. Maybe. Not like the mechanics of a farm. Right. Okay. I don't know. In 1858, he served as a member of the Utah Territorial Legislature. Then in 1872, following church orders, he moved from Iron County to an area near the Colorado River, where he established a heavily used ferry crossing on the river at a site known as Lee's Ferry. So that's how we have the nearby ranch was the Lonely Dell Ranch. Okay. So the ferry, the ranch. Um, It is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places along with the ferry site. Hmm. So here is where Lee has earned the nickname of him being the most controversial figure in Mormon history. I feel like that has to change now. Yes, and where the scariness comes. (laughs) So (laughs) in Utah, there is a place called Mountain Meadows. Okay. When groups wanted to travel west to California, they would have to cross over the long Mojave Mm -hmm. Desert. I don't know why that word. I just can't get it. I just, I don't know why I can't get that word. Mojave. Mountain Meadows was a rest stop along the old Spanish Trail in the Utah Territory that acted as a staging area in southern Utah for the groups to prepare for their long travel. So okay. they could kind of stop here, get the food, supplies, everything they needed before they continued on. Mm-hmm. In September of 1857, an emigrant group from Arkansas, the Baker Fancher Group, was going to make this trek and were camping at Mountain Meadows to prepare. The Baker train was led by Captain John Twitty Baker from Coral County, and the Fancher train was led by seasoned expeditioner Alex Fancher, who was from Benton County. The group had started with over 200 people, though as the journey continued, some groups split off, others joined in, kind of throughout the whole thing. Though the group was large and often changing, the party was prepared. They had wagons, traveling carriages, and a large herd of cattle with what was believed to be over a 1,000 oxen as well as some horses. How do you... 
Literally, I don't know. So they had a lot. They- those those traveling in the group were all headed to California for different reasons. Some were heading there to meet up with family who are gold rush who are awaiting their arrival. Some wanted to find the California gold. Some wanted to permanently settle in California. Some wanted to drive cattle west for profit. All different reasons, but the same goal: get California. They carpooled. <laughs> <laughs> In the early morning hours of Monday, September 7th, as they were camping, the Baker Fancher group was attacked by a group of Native Americans and Mormon militiamen dressed as Native Americans. Uh, So much is not okay with that. The attackers were set up in a small ravine southeast of the camp. They began shooting at the camp. I'm just going to call it the BF Party. So the BF Party tried to defend themselves by encircling and lowering their wagons to use as a shield. They also dug shallow trenches and were throwing dirt below and into the wagons, all as ways to protect themselves from the gunfire. Jesus. During this opening attack alone, seven emigrants were killed. They were buried somewhere within the wagon encirclement. Sixteen more had been wounded. This siege went on for days, during which the emigrant families had little, then no, access to fresh water and their ammunition was quickly depleting. It's not nice. (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> Five days after this initial attack, on Friday, September 11th, 1857, the BF party noticed a white flag waving. They were approached by two Mormon militiamen. These men were followed by Indian agent and militia officer John Lee. Lee spoke to the group of emigrants and told them that he had spoken to the Paiutes, so the Indians that they were with, mm-hmm. the Native Americans, and negotiated a truce. He said that the attack was over. If they gave them their livestock, supplies, and weapons, he could escort their group 36 miles back to Cedar City, under Mormon protection the entire way. That is some shady shit right there. Running low on water and ammunition and have... There's a birdie. Aw. Oh, my goodness. I didn't realize it was right there. Yeah. I saw the one in the tree. He had a friend. His friend was with him on the window. Me. Aw. Running low on water and ammunition and having already lost a few, the emigrants accepted the offer. They surrendered their weapons and were let out of their wagon encirclement. That is stealing. That is until a signal was given, and the Mormon militiamen turned and murdered the male members of the BF party standing by their side. The militia then let the group of Paiute Indians attack and execute the women and children of the group. So this part is really not good, so skip ahead like 15 seconds if you don't want to hear this next part, but you have to hear it, so tough luck for you. So this part is from Wikipedia, so I'm just going to quote it. Quote, Some children were killed while in their mother's arms or after being crushed by the butts of rifles or boot heels. It's really bad. I know. (laughs) The bodies of the dead were looted, then either left in shallow graves or just out in the open. In the end, the Mormon militia and the Paiute Indians massacred 120 to 140 men, women, and children of the BF party, leaving behind 17 small children as the only survivors. The survivors were How is this controversial? He sucks. I'll get to how it's controversial again. Okay. The survivors were all between the ages of nine months and six years. Side note, some of the young children were taken in by Mormon families I was wondering about that. in southern Utah, presumably because they were too young to tell anyone about the massacres. So they tried to get them out so if they were questioned, they wouldn't be there anymore. The children were later reclaimed by the U.S. Army and returned to relatives, though there is a legend that says that one girl was not returned and rather lived out her life among the Mormons. Hmm. Anywho, the members of the Mormon militia were all sworn to secrecy and a plan was formulated where all the blame for the massacre would fall on the Paiute Indians. That's not nice. In his own autobiography, William Ashworth, I guess he was just there, said that after the massacre, quote, leaders among the white men had bound themselves under the most binding oaths to never reveal their part in it. Which is funny because I'm pretty sure that's what, like, corporations do now. What, if something bad happens, they swear themselves to secrecy? Well, yeah, and they, like, blame other people. Like, find a scapegoat. Yeah, Mm -hmm. when really, like, they're pulling the strings. Oh, yeah. So one of the first motives for this attack, like what is believed, was that the general atmosphere of rising tensions between the U.S. federal government and Mormon settlers. So this coming from the Utah War of 1857 to 1858, which was an armed confrontation between Mormon settlers in the Utah Territory and the armed forces of the U.S. government. Well, maybe if you weren't being icky. (laughs) Stop being icky. (laughs) Yeah. Another was the strident Mormon teachings where the men may have felt justified in the massacre because of these teachings. A hundred percent. They justify a lot of things because of those teachings. Yep. So they had faced a lot of prejudice earlier on, especially with the killing of Joseph Smith and a few other prominent Mormon leaders. They all came to think that those responsible for these deaths were certain people from Arkansas, where the BF party happened to be from. They felt that they needed to execute God's judgment against the wicked and murder any of the members who had killed their leaders. With this, there were rumors that members of the BF party had been involved in the murders of Mormons in 1838, the war I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. This specific massacre of the Mormons became known as the Hans Mill Massacre. So they believe that was another reason for this massacre was because 
the BF members from Arkansas had killed Mormons earlier. So, so this is like retribution. Yeah. There was also the theory of war hysteria caused in part by events related to the Utah War of 1857. The Mormons, well, and I'm sure it's also like, look, we got some shit going on in the South and the North, and we need you to calm the fuck down because we can't control the West right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the Mormons believed that they were going to be attacked by the U.S. Army, so they prepared for a full-on siege. High up Mormon officials were starting to scare the group, telling them they needed to stockpile grain and to be prepared. Damn. It is believed that this created fear and tension among the Mormons, so they were eager to, quote, fight and take vengeance for the cruelties that had been inflicted upon us in the States. Mm-hmm. And some believe that Brigham Young played a role in provoking the massacre. I'm sure he did. Because he held a view that this specific group posed an actual threat to them and believed that they may have played a role in past crimes against Mormons. Mm. So a lot of it they're trying to justify, like, well, our teachings say this, and they killed us earlier, so now we just have to kill them. Yeah, that's what they do a lot of the time. Well, the teachings say this, so I'm allowed to be a jackass. Yep. It is reported that apparently Brigham Young had received a letter at his office on the same day as the massacre. It had been dated earlier, just ended up getting to him the day that the massacre took place. Mm -hmm. The letter asked Young what the Mormon militia should do about the BF party. So they wrote to him saying, hey, this party's coming through. Right. He told the group to let the group pass through the territory unbothered. He sent his letter back to the group, but it arrived on September 13th, two days late. Later, though. Again, I don't understand how he's controversial. He just sucks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't get what we are questioning he's about He's controversial whether. in the Mormon community. He's not controversial with us. Um, he's controversial in their community. Because they obviously have a hard time telling the difference between right and wrong. Yes. So some believe that Brigham Young and other Utah Territory officials had actually encouraged the massacre beforehand and afterwards denied any role that they may have had. Again, a belief sprouted from what I said earlier mm-hmm. with the whole... Yes. Thing. Some of the property of the dead had been looted and taken by the Native Americans, but large amounts of cattle and personal property had been taken by the Mormons in southern Utah. Some of the possessions were auctioned off, some was traded, some Lee kept on his own. Brigham Young heard about what had been taken and was so appalled that he ordered an investigation be done into the massacre. Good. On September 29th, 1857, he asked Lee about the massacre as Lee was there. Mm-hmm. He said that the Indians were solely responsible for the killing and that, quote, no white men were mixed up in it. Mm. But later, Lee's story changed, and he admitted and maintained that he had acted under orders from his militia leads, though he protested the orders. So he didn't want to do it, but he had to act under their leads. Isn't he the lead? One of them, yeah. Okay, cool. So either way, in the end, Young did not work well with Young, like Brigham Young, did Mm -hmm. not work well with federal authorities for the investigation causing many blunders. Mm. And the Mormon church believed Lee, so he remained active in their religion and in local government for several years after. But two years after the massacre, U.S. Army officer James Henry Carleton was sent to investigate. (laughs) He was convinced that the Mormons had played a larger role than they were letting on, that they were the main perpetrators. He examined the scene of the massacre and came to believe that the Paiutes played a very minimal role and that the whole attack had been planned and executed by the Mormons. Cha. (laughs) Shocking. The remains of the 37 people were found and buried. So there were more than 37, but those are all the, like, remains that they were able to find. Mm -hmm. The troops built a cairn over the graves and made a large cross, which was engraved with, quote, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. There was also a granite slab that was engraved with, quote, Here 120 men, women, and children were massacred in cold blood early in September 1857. They were from Arkansas. It's like not heartfelt at all, but nope. Some claim that in 1861, Lee went to Mountain Meadows with an entourage. They had the cairn and cross destroyed while saying, Vengeance is mine, and I have taken a little. Hmm. Not nice. (laughs) In late 1860s, public questions were arising about the exact nature of the massacre, as it was public news now and everyone was aware, as it had gone wild in the media. Mm -hmm. That attention started to turn turn towards Lee, and he was unable to keep up his charade that he hadn't been a willing participant. He even went into hiding for a bit when a federal judge came to Utah to investigate the massacre and his part in it. Like, that doesn't make you seem suspicious at all. Yeah, right. Then in 1870, Brigham Lee was openly condemned for covering up the massacre. That same year, Young excommunicated Lee from the LDS Church for his part in the massacre and exiled him to a remote part of northern Arizona. Nice. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) This is also at the time when, like, 11 of his wives left him. So he was... He's not doing good. He's feeling sad. Yeah, he's a little sad. He only had 45 now instead of, like... (laughs) (laughs) Again, okay, that's a tough transition. <laughs> really tough. In 1874, John Doyle Lee was arrested and tried for his participation in and his leading of the massacre. There were nine indictments against him. His first trial began on July 23, 1875, in Beaver, Utah, before a jury of eight Mormons and four non-Mormons. 
On August 5th, the case ended inconclusively with a hung jury, meaning that the jury could not agree on the verdict. Mm. It is believed that this was due to the prosecution's attempt to portray Brigham Young as the mastermind behind the massacre, not Lee. Oh, yeah, that was a mistake. Right. A second trial was held in 1876 and began on September 13th, this time before an all-Mormon jury. This time, the prosecution placed the blame entirely on Lee. Even throughout the entire trial, Lee never denied his own complicity, but he did claim that he never personally killed anyone and that he was a vocally reluctant participant. That's only half true. When that defense didn't work, he said that he was being used as a scapegoat, who was being used to draw attention away from the other Mormon leaders who had been involved. And though he was saying that, he did say that Brigham Young had no knowledge of the event beforehand. He had also become, he had only become aware of the news after the event broke. I mean, that's true. He said, quote, I have always believed since that day that General George A. Smith was then visiting southern Utah to prepare the people for the work of exterminating Captain F.'s train of emigrants, and I now believe that he was sent for that purpose by the direct command of Brigham Young. He was found guilty, convicted, and sentenced to death. As was required by Utah Territory statute, the sentence can choose how they die, so either by being hung, shot, or beheaded. Okay. Lee chose to be shot. I get that. On March 23, 1877, Lee was executed by firing squad. To make his execution a little sweeter, the execution took place at Mountain Meadows, the site of the massacre that had occurred 20 years earlier. Damn. But he got to choose the spot? And his Ew! Re- uh-huh. And his reasoning was that he believed, given the enormity of the crime, that he had to perform a sufficient blood atonement to get him into the celestial kingdom. You know what if, would have worked the, to do that the first time? Hmm. Just not kill people. Well, <laughs> his last words were something along the lines of, quote, I do not believe everything that is now being taught and practiced by Brigham Young. I do not care who hears it. It is my last word. I have been sacrificed in a cowardly, dastardly manner. There is no man I hate worse than a traitor. Especially, I could not betray an innocent man. I have but little to say this morning. Of course, I feel it's that actually I... actually a lot. You've said quite a bit. I know. That's what I thought, too. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I feel that I am at the brink of eternity, and the solemnities of eternity should rest upon my mind at the present. I am ready to die. I trust in God. I have no fear. Death has no terror. Years and years after his death, on April 20th, 1961, Lee's membership in the church was posthumously reinstated by the LDS Church. Oh, my God. He has so many descendants, considering he had 19 wives and 56 children, that a number of his descendants have served as solicitor generals, senators, Supreme Court justices, secretary of the interior. So this part's wild. In 2007, families and descendants of the children who had survived the massacre came together in Utah for the 150th anniversary of the massacre. Family stories were compared, and all stories turned out to be fairly similar. All of the families agreed that there were stories of how the Mormons had dressed up as the natives and that none of the Native Americans had even participated in the massacre. Family stories tell of these children being taken by, quote, Indians who washed of their skin and turned white. So the Mormons had dressed up as the Indians, did the massacre, and then blamed it on them. And then, of course, they let him back in. Mm -hmm. Makes so much sense. Now there are three monuments at the site of the massacre, with two actually at Mountain Meadow. Mountain Meadows Association built one in 1990. It is maintained by the Utah State Division of Parks and Recreation. In 1999, the Mormon Church built another, which they maintain, and a third was built and placed in the central square of Harrison, Arkansas, which is where the parties were from. Mm -hmm. It is a replica of Carlton's original marker. It is maintained by the Mountain Meadow Massacre Monument Foundation. Ooh, ma 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 ma. I know. (laughs) So that is John Doyle Lee. He sucks. Um, We think he sucks, but in... Mormon history, he is considered a controversial figure. I wonder if one of his descendants is the Warrens. The Warrens? Yeah, those are the people in the documentary. Oh, possibly because he had 56 children. Yeah. So, and pretty much at that point, everyone's related because if you're also taking your children as wives. Right. It's horrific. I do want to watch the documentary. But yeah, so I didn't go too much into their religion because I knew that would have been a yeah. That can be its own podcast. Um, you don't need to. So yeah, I looked into one man instead. That's probably for the best. 120 people is his count on Murderpedia. That's crazy. hmm Because of my friend, he always asks me, he's like, what's scary in this state? So I like tell him like what we're going to be recording. Mm-hmm. And he was like, ooh, for Utah, are you going to do Mormons? And I said, actually, yeah. <laughs> that I am. That I that am. That I am. But yeah, so John Doyle Lee. Well, a controversial, non-controversial. Yeah. We know he's bad, but no. He's a non-controversial reinst- controversy. He's reinstated into the church, so. That is controversial. <laughs> <laughs> oh. hey. uh. <laughs> all right, Mackenzie, what Utah story do you have today? So we have all heard about common personal items being cursed, such as the box, 
a phone number, which you can hear more about on our Cursed Items episode, um, available wherever you get podcasts. Or even a doll. (laughs) There are also curses that are attached to treasure and riches, like the Hope Diamond or the Ark of the Covenant, which Jews and Christians believe hold the OG Ten Commandments. Oh. The one given by God to Moses on the rocks. (laughs) And the Hope Diamond you can listen on our Cursed Objects episode. Oh, you talked about that too? Oh, no, not on the cursed ones. I talked about it for the DC episode. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, I thought you talked about the box. Yeah, I did. The big box. Yeah. I didn't know how to say it and or spell it, and I didn't want to look it up, so that's why I just went with box and phone number. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, dipic box. The type of curse that we have today is an old-fashioned Hollywood cursed film. Oh, love it. Movie curses can show themselves in many different ways. They might be directed to a particular role, like the Superman curse, which Mm -hmm. refers to the violent tragedies for actors who have played the superhero, or Jesus Christ, played by Jim Caviezel, in Passion of the Christ, who was struck Mm -hmm. by lightning, dislocated his shoulder, and suffered from hypothermia and pneumonia all while filming the movie. Wasn't he struck by lightning twice? I don't know if it was twice, but I know multiple people on that set were struck by lightning. Oh, okay. That might have been it. Yeah. Jesus is like, stop. Don't do this movie. And they still did it anyway. The curse could be attached to the set of a movie, like in The Exorcist, whose misfortune got so bad that they had had an actual priest bless the film set. Or a poltergeist set using real human skeletons, which many believe is the cause of the curse and premature deaths of the film's actors. Some curses don't show themselves until post-production, like with the movie Rebel Without a Cause, which is a coming-of-age drama that featured James Dean, Salmino, and Natalie Wood. Many of the stars in that movie experienced violent premature deaths. Mm -hmm. James Dean, 24, died in a horrific Mm -hmm. car crash about a month before the movie was released. He was only 24? He's a baby. Oh my god. Yeah. Sal Mino, 37, was stabbed to death by a mugger outside his apartment. Natalie Wood, 43, supposedly drowned Mm -hmm. after drinking too much while on a weekend getaway with her husband Robert Wagner and friend Christopher Walken Mm -hmm. on a yacht. I know all about that story. It was ultimately ruled an accident. Some movies aren't really cursed, but more so victims of human error or negligence. However you want to put it. (laughs) For example, on the set of The Twilight Zone, the movie, one of the segments was directed by John Landis and it ended in tragedy. During filming, Vic Moreau's character was going to rescue two children from a helicopter. This part is icky and bad. Okay. 15 second skip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It ended up decapitating Morrow and one of the child actors and crushing the other child to death. Mm -hmm. You knew about this? Mm -hmm. I did not know about this. Yeah, I know about that. Oh. (laughs) I really like to read articles that pop up where it's like, weird things that have happened in movie sets. So I click on it and Mm. I've read all about these. Yeah. Did you know about mine? I don't know. I have to hear it first. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just by the name, no. Okay. Landis and the other producers were criticized for illegally hiring child actors and utilizing them in dangerous scenes. However, Landis avoided a manslaughter conviction, which means he was charged. Mm. The cursed movie I'm telling you about today is kind of a mixture. There is very likely a cause, but because nothing definitive has ever been proven, Mm -hmm. there is a possibility it could just be a mystical curse. Okay. It's not. (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler alert. Yeah. It's also fitting that this movie is considered cursed because it is is frequently referred to as the worst movie ever made. Uh Oh, (laughs) jeez. Yeah. The Conqueror is a historical drama starring John Wayne as the infamous Mongolian conqueror Genghis Khan. I have heard of this movie. Okay. That's fine. Not about anything with it. That's okay. We don't really talk about the movie all that much. Oh, okay. I've never seen it either, so there's that. Apparently not a lot of people have. It's considered the worst (laughs) movie ever. (laughs) Along with a star-studded cast, including Susan Hayward, Angus Moorhead, and Pedro Armanderas. The movie premiered in 1956 and was directed by Dick Powell and produced by the eccentric Howard Hughes. The premise of the movie is basically Genghis Khan falls in love with a captured princess played by Susan Howard Hayward, which reverse Stockholm Syndrome? Because he fell in love with someone he captured versus oh. in love with your capture. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that's called. <laughs> Stockholm by proxy. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're going to go with. <laughs> Howard Hughes wanted to find a location that could pass for the Mongolian desert and felt St. George, Utah was the perfect location. Nearby Snow Canyon has dunes and red sandstone cliffs that could pass for the Gobi Desert. Starting in June of 1954, 200 cast and crew members spent 13 weeks filming and living in the southwest Utah desert. Many say this movie was cursed from the start given its early pitfalls. Howard Hughes spent about $6 million, which is about $60 million today, 
on the production of the movie. John Wayne was the third choice to play the main character, although he may come to regret that role. Who were the two before him? Uh, one was Marlon Brando. Hmm. That was the first choice. And then one was another guy I never heard of. <laughs> they both said no. Why? I think one of them already had a commitment and the other one didn't want to. Oh, interesting. Something like that. In fact, I'm pretty sure this movie was specifically written for Marlon Brando to play. Oh. And he said no. Interesting. Yeah. That sucks. Yep. According to director Dick Powell's son, Norman, the famed director only accepted the duty of director. How many times can I say director in a sentence? <laughs> for the money. Not sure what money he thought he was going to get because the movie made only... Four million in the box Ooh. office. Ooh, yeah, and it was a sixty million dollar. No, no, that's what it had been today. But it oh, was but six then. million, and it only got four million, so it didn't make any money. Right, yeah. right, lost money. Yeah, so I don't know what money he thought he was going to get. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, hotels were booked, buses were rented, food would be catered from local restaurants, and the local Boy Scout troops provided the crew with hundreds of chairs and tables. 700 locals were employed to work on the film, and an estimated seven hundred and fifty thousand was brought into the small town's economy. Locals were hired as extras in a group of 300 Native Americans. I'm pretty sure from the same tribe you talked about. The Paiutes? I think so. Hmm. I saw that somewhere, but there's 300 from local tribes. Okay. <laughs> were used in a scene depicting a Mongolian village. Okay. Don't worry. We'll address the problems in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> if we well, even need to address them. They're pretty bright. They are, but it's... Well, okay. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> so those pitfalls continued when filming began. The cast and crew had to endure 120-degree heat and constant dust storms, which is Fahrenheit, by the way. Yeah. Not Celsius. I but it's <laughs> really hot Celsius. <laughs> is that the right one? Celsius? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just saying if it was, what do you say, 120-degree Fahrenheit? Yeah. I think that would be like, if it was 120 degrees Celsius, that would be like a million degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it would. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We'd be dying because yeah. that's boiling. It does over boiling. Yeah. Because I we had to know both. Yeah. I forget what it is fair night. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. For 13 weeks, the cast and crew was covered head to toe in red dust. While they were filming, resting between takes, and even eating lunch and dinner. There was a flash flood that tore through that nearly destroyed the entire set. One place also said could have almost killed people, but I don't think anyone died in this. Okay. But it was bad. Yeah. Well, any flash flood is. Yeah. Lead actress Susan Hayward experienced a horrific ordeal when one of the animals used in a scene, a black panther, attacked her and almost mauled her to death. Oh. Once filming was complete, Howard Hughes took 60 tons of sand back to L.A. with him for any reshoots that were needed. Okay. Which I get, but I, I get, feel like we like... could just color sand red. Right. The movie premiered on February 22nd, 1956. Movie historian Harvey Medved told Mysteries at the Museum that the movie was considered a flop to critics and audiences alike. He said, quote, John Wayne, who's great as everyone's favorite cowboy, but in the Genghis Khan story, everybody is laughing it off the screen. Oh, Many agreed that the role of Genghis Khan had been miscasted. Miscast. miscast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aside from the fact that John Wayne is not Asian. Right. And inappropriate measures were taken to make him look the part. Oh, no. They figured that out way later. That's not why they said it was bad. Okay. They just didn't think he did a good job. Right. In general. It had nothing to do with his ethnicity. With the looks. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we claim as the problem. Right. And he was sucky at the job. <laughs> Writer of the film, Oscar Millard, later stated that, quote, the company had just missed being wiped out by a flash flood and Duke, John Wayne, had been drunk for three days. Oh. Not that it made much difference, except when a bender bloated him. It was hard to tell. His performance, drunk or sober, was the way other actors tend to perform if drunk. Oh, <laughs> The film was listed in the 1978 book, The 50 Worst Films of All Time. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and in 1980, Wayne Pos humusly posthumously that received a golden turkey award which are awarded to movies and performances considered the worst in history in the worst casting category for his performance of Genghis Khan ouch yeah at least if he did he's yeah but ouch yeah it is what happened in the years following its release that caught everyone's attention the movie's biggest stars all seem to be succumbing to the same ill-fated demise in 1962 director Dick Powell developed lymphoma and died in January 1963 Pedro R. Armanderas died of suicide in June 1963 after being diagnosed with terminal cancer. Oh. Armanderas had survived cancer of the kidney four years after the after finishing the movie, but later learned that he had terminal cancer of the lymphatic system. 
Uh, lead actress Susan Hayward died of brain cancer in 1975. Oh, my God. Hayward's son, Tim Barker, later told People magazine in 1980, quote, My mother was pathetic in the end. She was in a fetal position. She had lost her swollen re- reflex, and she had pneumonia and had lost all her hair. I don't think he means pathetic in, like, a bad way. Okay, pathetic yeah. Pathetic as in, like, she was— how, how words change over time. Yes. Yeah. Like, I don't think—yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Between 1965 and 1975, Hayward was diagnosed with skin, breast, and uterine cancers. Oh, my God. I know. Angus Moorhead died from uterine cancer in 1974. And John... Wait, what? What did I say? Angus? Mm. It's because I spelled it all. <laughs> Angus. <laughs> Do control H. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ag... Ness. Wow. Talk about a dyslexia move. I just switched the G in the N. Okay. Replace all. Me too, mommy. No. <laughs> okay. Now they're all... What the fuck? They change... <laughs> no. In the word changes. <laughs> <laughs> it changes. It does that too, which is so funny. <laughs> what the fuck? It changed it to C-H capital A-G-N-E-S. Uh-huh. It does that. It it has <laughs> Now, for whatever reason, it scrolled to the bottom. Okay, well, if I say change is weird. <laughs> changes. Changes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Agnes Moorhead died from uterine cancer in 1974. John Wayne developed lung cancer in 1964 and eventually died from stomach cancer in 1979. It wasn't just the stars. By 1980, 91 of the 220 cast and crew members had developed cancer. Oh, my God. Of those diagnosed, 41 of them had died of the disease. Jeez. And that was by 1980. I don't know what it would look like today. Today. Mm -hmm. These statistics were higher than the national average of cancer diagnoses among a group of people at the time. Wow. Even family members of the cast weren't safe from alarming brushes with cancer. Michael Wayne, son of John Wayne, developed skin cancer in 1975, and his brother Patrick was operated on for a breast tumor in 1969. Were they also at the scene of everything? Mm -hmm. They visited their parents. Okay. Fortunately, Patrick's was benign. My gosh. Tim Barker, son of Susan Hayward, had a benign tumor removed from his mouth in 1968. He also had visited his mom. Mm -hmm. All these diagnoses couldn't be just terrible. Mm. You were right. Couldn't be? No. Couldn't be just terrible and blah, 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 blah. We need an editor. (laughs) (laughs) She is one. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) Mom, you want a job we can't pay you for? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, is it Juliana? It is. Can I go unlock the door? Yep. All these diagnoses couldn't just... No. <laughs> Damn it. made me nervous. <laughs> my mom has seen my writing. See, that's why I was happy I was going first. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Don't listen. Like, plug your ears or something. <laughs> this is why I'm not going to do well live, okay? Oh, my God, I know. Uh, all these diagnoses couldn't be just terrible coincidences. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Was the curse bestowed upon the movie that caused this life-changing fate among the cast and crew? Or was something more sinister? People magazine investigated and published an article drawing a connection between the high cancer rate among cast and crew of The Conqueror and within the town of St. George. People reported... When I say people, I mean the magazine. Okay. Okay. (laughs) People reported that 137 miles from the town of St. George was the Yucca Flats in Nevada, which, how fun, a yucca. (laughs) (laughs) Going to a Yucca Flat. (laughs) You are so weird. (laughs) Because I'm nervous. (laughs) (laughs) That had been used as a nuclear testing site from January 1951 until August 1963. While no bombs had been dropped during the production of The Conqueror, 11 explosions occurred the year before. There was a 51.5 kiloton fired on April 25th, 1953, and a 32.4 kiloton, codenamed Harry, that was fired on May 19th. For reference, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was 13 kilotons. And how much are these ones? 51 and 32. Oh. Yeah. Harry was dropped on May 19th, and moments before impact, the winds began to shift, which placed St. George immediately downwind of the nuclear testing site. When Harry detonated at 5.05 a.m., radioactive dust rained down on the sands in southwest Utah. A year later, while searching for a location that could double as Mongolia, Howard Hughes contacted government officials to see if it was safe to film near St. George. Hughes asked experts at the Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, quote, is it going to be safe to shoot my movie, The Conqueror, here in St. George, Utah, in Snow Canyon? The government told him and the residents of the town that they were perfectly safe. 
1955 AEC booklet distributed near the test site advised, quote, your best action is not to be worried about fallout. Yep. Okay. Dr. Robert C. Pendleton was the director of radiological health at the University of Utah in 1980 and a former AEC researcher. He told People Magazine, quote, fallout was very abundant more than a year after Harry. Some of the isotopes, such as steronium-90 and cesium-137, which I feel like I've heard like Jimmy Neutron say, (laughs) (laughs) would not have diminished much. Pendleton points out that radioactivity can concentrate in hot spots, such as the rolling dunes of of Snow Canyon, a natural reservoir for windblown material where much of the conquer was filmed. Pendleton also notes that radioactive substances enter the food chain. By eating local meat and produce, the Conquer casting crew were increasing their risk. Mm. Dr. Pendleton told people, quote, With these numbers, this case could qualify as an epidemic. The connection between fallout radiation and cancer in individual cases has been practically impossible to prove conclusively. But in a group this size, you'd expect only 30-some cancers to develop. With 91, I think the tie-in to their exposure on the set of the Conqueror would hold up in a court of law. Jeez. According to People, Agnes Moorhead was one of the first members of this group to make a connection between the film and the fallout. Her close friend, Sandra Gould, who was featured with Moorhead on the TV show Bewitched, recalls the long recalls that long before Moorhead had developed uterine cancer, she had heard rumors about some radioactive germs on location in Utah. Ew. Moorhead had made the observation, quote, everybody in that picture has gotten cancer and died. As she was dying, she told her best friend, Debbie Reynolds, quote, I should never have taken that part. Jeez. Another actress in the film, Janine Gerson, contracted skin cancer in 1965. Surgery cured her temporarily, but in 1977, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, she underwent a mastectomy and began chemotherapy, which continued through 1980. Gerson told People Magazine, quote, I've always been convinced that it's more than a coincidence. Gerson hired an attorney to press a class action lawsuit against the U.S. government. She said, quote, I hope the Waynes, the Powells, the ones with recognizable names will come forward and say something, perhaps join our lawsuit. Yeah. Gerson recalled a constant wind whipping through the location, setting up dust storms so severe that Director Powell, who, as you remember, got lymph cancer in 1963 and died when it spread to his lungs, Mm -hmm. often wore a surgical mask on set. Pedro Armanderas Jr. remembers his father's role as a Mongolian soldier, said, quote, he did take an awful lot of falls and was constantly having to be hosed down due to the heavy dust. Dr. Harold Knapp, the Defense Nuclear Agency's DNA, advisor to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a former member of the Fallout Studies branch of the AEC, says experts knew better even then. He told people, quote, the government definitely had a complete awareness of what was going on. To a trained professional, the information contained in some of their once confidential reports is most shocking. A published report from 1980 that was prepared for congressional investigators on the impact of the bomb test concluded, quote, all evidence suggesting that radiation was having harmful effects, be it on sheep or on people, was not only disregarded, but actually suppressed. The greatest irony of our atmospheric nuclear testing program is that the only victims of the U.S. nuclear arms since World War II have been our own people. Jeez. Ellen Powell, daughter of Dick Powell, was among some of the children to go to Utah to visit parents who were working on the production of The Conqueror. Mm -hmm. Her and her brother Norman were understandably worried about the consequences of being in that area at the time, especially after what happened with their father and other people who worked on the movie. Ellen told people, quote, how dare people not be warned if there is some knowledge of even a potential danger. Right. She continues and says, I'm all for looking into this thing because possibly it could help a few people. Her brother Norman acknowledged that a lawsuit by the relatives of movie stars could help draw attention to the plight of the 15,000 residents of of St. George. My gosh. Powell said, quote, these poor folks with no celebrities among them are just quietly dying out and nobody cares. But with a high number of casualties among a Hollywood cast, maybe someone will sit up and take notice. In June of this year, 2024. Mm Mm-hmm. William Nunez released the documentary The Conqueror Hollywood Fallout that explores the dark history of the Conqueror and wanted to spread more awareness about the impacts of extensive nuclear testing done in Nevada and New Mexico. He wanted to give downwinders a voice in telling their stories. It wasn't until the 1980 People magazine investigation that linked John Wayne's death to the nuclear testing that the U.S. government even investigated the area around the Nevada test site. Mm -hmm. According to the Nevada National Security site, there were 928 nuclear tests conducted between 1951 and 1992. How many? 928. Jeez. About 100 of those tests were atmospheric and 828 were underground. I don't know what the difference is besides outside, inside. Well, yeah, one's in the atmosphere. So what's still like lingering up there? And then one's on the ground. I don't know if the ones underground have any impact, though, because I figured they're 
pretty big bombs. So even if they were underground, I feel like they would probably get outside. Mm, well, yeah. Yeah. In St. George, men in their 30s developed prostate cancers. Women came down with thyroid cancers, and the rates of leukemia in children were three times higher than the national average. The documentary shares how the cancer rates and death toll climbed due to the continuing testing in Nevada. In the film, residents of southern Utah share their memories of watching the testing, how they contracted cancer, as well as their family members who succumbed to it. The downwinders also share their stories about the fight for justice for themselves and for their families. They share about the efforts made to force Congress to pass the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. This legislation includes an apology from the government for covering up the dangers of the testing and compensation towards the victims. Wow. Between 1980 and 1990, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch had unsuccessfully pushed various downwinder compensation measures. It wasn't until 1990 that that he finally achieved victory when the Senate finally passed legislation that would compensate the downwinders who were affected by the federal government's open-air Nevada nuclear tests. A Republican. (laughs) In Utah. Yeah. Republicans were different back then. No shit. We'll get to that. (laughs) (laughs) The Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was officially signed into law by President George H. Bush, so number one, in October of 1990. In conclusion... (laughs) <laughs> Susan Hayward's son, Tim Barker, told People in 1980 that he hoped the story of the Conqueror's grim aftermath will be a cautionary message. Barker said, quote, The point is to finally focus public attention. Over the years, a lot of people, government and private industries alike, have been dumping things into the air and water without worrying about the effects. The damage in this case is done, but if enough people get angry about it, maybe they can minimize the harm for the future. <laughs> in 2024, Nuez told St. George News, the guy who made the documentary, mm-hmm. That he hopes people viewing his film will see that, quote, nothing changes. <laughs> Nunez said, quote, the issues and topics that were part of the 1950s in regards to nuclear power are still an issue that haunts us to this day. He also noted that the expiration of the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. The extension of the act was passed in the Senate of this year in February. Oh. And sent to the House of Representatives at the beginning of March, where it was stopped from being extended and therefore expired completely. Mm-hmm. You can probably guess which party is the majority in each legislative institution. I don't think I can. So, yeah, that was the curse of the conqueror. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be a mystical thing that happened? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be a government cover up? I don't know. Geez, that's so bad. I know. And it wasn't until a celebrity was put in the news that the government even cared even then people was reporting that like the government would not look into anything they weren't talking about it Mm -hmm. like it wasn't until they asked all these people who were former whatevers right they were like oh yeah they knew yeah oh absolutely they knew yeah so the extension would have allowed more of those people to have time to put in a claim Mm -hmm. and now that they don't have time because it's expired too late yep so that site is probably still not a hell like not a good site correct yeah yeah it's pretty much people either downwind of new mexico Mm -hmm. or nevada because i think those were the only two places they had the testing i think i don't know i looked briefly through it and those are the states that i saw oh okay (laughs) (laughs) so yeah i do love curses of movies and stuff but not when those curses are like oh this person died and this person died and then all these people got cancer and then died yeah which, why it was like, is it a curse or is it just negligence? I mean, yeah, just negligence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a curse at all because where you were filming was already not a good place to be anyways. Yep, you were doomed for failure. I didn't even get up on a soapbox. I figured the box spoke for itself. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, it did. Yeah. So well, there you go. Nicely done. Thank you. So that's Utah, everyone. Get we. Mm-hmm. Cool nature. Scary people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, follow us. On all the things. Send us an email at scarystatepodcast at gmail.com. And anything that we ask you, just let us know the answers. Yeah, actually answer our questions because I know we could Google it, but we want to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, stay scary. Stay safe. I need you. (laughs) 